let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this time to celebrate the life of your son, his birth, his work, and of course his resurrection. What incredible proof you've given us, Father, to depend on, to believe in, to be certain of. Father, we pray for those here this morning. We pray for those that aren't. We pray for those that are still lost, that are missing times like this. We do just ask for your blessings on this morning's message. It's in Christ's name we pray, by the power of the Spirit. Amen. Resurrection Sunday special. There's just one question the Spirit wants me to ask you this morning. What's the greatest news you've ever heard? We're going to talk about this. What's the greatest news you've ever heard? I was just to ask, I guess, a common folk this question. Was it when you first heard the words, I love you, and understood them to be true? Was it the day you heard your spouse say, I do? Was it the day you heard a doctor say, congratulations, it's a boy or a girl? Was it the day, and you're all unique, fill in the blank. I'm sure there's lots of folks, I mean, you watch a Super Bowl and they say, this is the greatest day of my life, I won a game. Or was it the day you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? Maybe it wasn't the first time. That couldn't be the greatest. Or the second. Or the third. Maybe it took years to be converted, as it did with many of us. And I was thinking about that, and I'm just going to be completely honest. And I'm here I am behind a pulpit on Resurrection Sunday, ordained... uh, by God to teach his word I don't know the exact time or day that God saved me I just know that he did based on what holy scripture has since informed me of after the fact I know a lot of people that say I'm saved I'm saved But there's no proof in their heart. They just want to believe that they have that, you know, ticket to heaven type thing. I'd rather believe in what Scripture gives me after the fact to assure me of my faith, to assure me of my salvation. And it's much less about when or even how. It's much more about that it is. So I was thinking about that. I just know that he saved me based on what Holy Scripture has since informed me of after the fact. He didn't knock me down when I was on my way to do Satan's bidding like he did with Paul. He didn't tell me to drop my fishing nets and follow him like he did with Peter and Andrew. He didn't tell me, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise like he did with the thief on the cross. I don't know when. But I do know how and why, now that my eyes have been opened. I suppose in my heart, and I'm being completely transparent here, I was a bit like Timothy for a time. Even doubting it could all really be true. 
not for others. Like I was perfectly fine with seeing saying others. Isn't that wonderful? They're saved. I mean, for me. Ever have that kind of doubt? Go to Psalm eight three. Psalm eight three. Psalm 8.3. So I don't know, I, uh, yeah, I guess I have a little Timothy in me. At least I did, more so. Psalm 8.3, when I look at the, your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? and the Son of Man, that you care for him. Who am I? Who are you? You're really going to save me? Have you met me? <laughs> Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Hmm. Think about that. For so long... We all were at enmity with the one who loved us before time even began. We were estranged, born as children of wrath, on a vector headed for destruction. What I do know today, though, is that God saved me from that. From otherwise certain death. He decided to save me. I hope all of you. My prayer is that he has saved all of you too. My great hope for you is that you find that you hear his voice in your life saying, be still. Be at peace. God says, I've done this for you, my child. Look at my work in, for, and even through you. That's your evidence. God likes the idea of evidence, you see. We want to sees things the way we want to believe them. We want to make them be true. We want to just make up our mind and that's the end of it type thing. And God says, no, I'm going to give you evidence for that peace. I pray all the time for your peace, my friends. And this peace usually persists with honest conviction. And that's where I help you. Help you see the light of Scripture, the Word of God, what it means, so that you can be convicted and have said peace. Because I can't give it to you. It's a gift from God. Faith comes from hearing the Word of Christ. Romans 10, 17. And that's where your peace comes from. I don't just want you to hear the good news. I want you to bathe in it. To abide in it. To live it. Go to Romans 5, 1. Romans 5, 1. This is my prayer for you. It's not a whole lot unlike Paul's prayer for those that he ministered to. Romans 5.1 Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now, to our question, that's pretty good news, right? I mean, you read Romans 5, that's, that's good news. That might be a candidate. Pretty great. But the question on the table remains, what's the greatest news you've ever heard? Are we there yet? this morning. Not sure. So let's continue. We might narrow our answer by reading this next passage. Go to Luke 2.1. Luke 2.1. We might get a little closer to what a lot of Christians might argue you know, what's the greatest news you've ever heard, the greatest thing you've ever heard about? Luke 2 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, Jesus, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. So you all know the story. Every Christmas, we read this passage or a parallel in one of the Gospels. And yeah, this is undoubtedly great news, right? Some might say the greatest. But I'll keep pressing you here. The question on the table remains, what's the greatest news you've ever heard? Is the birth of Jesus of Nazareth the greatest news of all time? Or is there another event worth our consideration? <coughs> I'll give you an analogy here. Just bear with me. Just trying to drive a certain point home. A baby girl is born in Harlem. She's small, frail, and undernourished her entire young existence. She grows up, she gets married, she has children, works hard her whole life. Still nothing extraordinary or necessarily remarkable about her, as far as the rest of the world is concerned. On the last day of her life, 
with her dying breath, she says to her caretaker, who she's gotten to know a little over the past few months, you know, Jesus Christ humbled himself to die for those who would believe in him. He sacrificed himself to pay the penalty of their guilt. And then she says something truly remarkable to her caretaker, because her caretaker had heard this all before. A lot of times that's where the gospel ends. Not enough room on the coin, you know. Not enough room after the pictures on the track that gets handed out. So the caretaker had heard this before. And they would say to themselves, you know, hmm, big deal. Anyone could say they died for my sins and even be a martyr for that cause. I mean, anybody could technically say that. I mean, I could say that for you today and then go die and that would be the end of it. And you say, I'll go cuckoo. But then the old woman from Harlem said, and he rose from the dead to declare with power that he is Lord over all. And he offers eternal life freely to sinners who will surrender to him in humble, repentant faith. Now this stopped her caretaker in their tracks. This was unbelievable news to think about. And the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ sunk deep into this person's soul. That the good news that Jesus wasn't just born to die for our sins, but was raised from the dead. The Holy Spirit drove this home using the word of power to convict this caregiver. And at that very moment, the old, unremarkable lady who was born in poverty in some corner of Harlem died. For reasons only known to God, this caregiver was the only person she ever had the privilege of evangelizing. Just one person. And when she met the Lord, the Lord said to her, beaming, beautiful face, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in a little thing. Welcome to my kingdom. So you have to consider this woman's life. What was the greatest achievement of all in this woman's life? The point I'm making here is that while it's incredible news that God gives life to a human body at birth and therefore grants that person life for a time on earth, what makes a person great or their life great or remarkable. Do we not proclaim greatness about people after we've gotten to know them? I mean, we might look back and spread that out, but isn't there some getting to know a person? Isn't there a life to be lived? Isn't greatness typically assigned at the end of life? Or after some achievement or some event? Furthermore, do we not relish the birth of the individual much more even once we reflect on the entirety of their life? There are a lot of people that are born and die, and we don't know anything about them. 
And they're not remarkable, or they're not called great just because they were born. I'll ask you a question. Do you know who Thomas Lincoln was? Born in 1812? Why not? How about his older brother, Abraham Lincoln? Ever heard of him? Some might say, oh man, the birth of Abraham Lincoln ought to be celebrated. So when we got him, you know, this whole thing. And yet, how is his birth any more remarkable than his brother Thomas's? Strictly speaking. What makes Abraham Lincoln's birth so much greater than Thomas Lincoln's birth? Do we not look at people in retrospect? The answer is yes. Someone's not remarkable just because they were born. That's a miracle, but that's another story. Don't get off track. Do we not look at people in retrospect and then assign greatness? Do we not celebrate a person's birth more once we've seen what they've accomplished throughout their lives? Just as a little P.S., aren't all people born sinners anyways? So I hope you're getting my point here. The question on the table is, what's the greatest news you've ever heard? Now, what if, for some strange reason, just bear with me, some strange reason, Jesus failed to stand up to the temptations of Satan in Matthew 4? He just failed. Let's just suppose that for a moment. Would you still celebrate his birth? Would you even know who he was? Sadly, probably not. But maybe his life would have been, I don't know, captured in the annals of history as a prophet of sorts. The reason you celebrate his birth is because, in retrospect, you know the details of his whole life. The reason you celebrate his birth is because, in retrospect, you know the details of his whole life. In other words, he was who he said he was. That's the point I'm making here this morning. I'm trying to get you to focus on the reason for this holiday that we're celebrating. Do you realize that if Christ didn't rise from the dead we'd have no evidence that God was satisfied with Christ's sacrifice? In this sense, Christ's resurrection was a message to God's children, whom he loves, that our faith is not in vain. This person overcame death. Christ's resurrection, therefore, is the linchpin of our faith because no one else in human history has ever made the claims he did about his own victory over death and had it come true.
So our first key principle this morning, Christ's resurrection was to settle the case in your soul, in your heart. Not God's. God doesn't need proof. He knows the end from the beginning. We don't. Christ's resurrection was to settle the case in your heart. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, 1. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. <clears throat> Paul here. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. He wrote, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And then look at how many times the word appeared, appears, in this passage. And that He, what? Appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that He raised Christ, whom He did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. That's life without resurrection. You just go and die. And that's what Paul's working out here. But, that's not true. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. 
For God has put all things in subjection under his feet, but when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Second key principle this morning. God reveals the great things about himself by revealing himself to us. In other words, he gives us evidence. He says, you see what I've done? You see what I've accomplished through my son? My son overcame death. Because that's what sin ushered in, you remember? If you sin in the garden, you shall die. And that's it. You see what my son did? He overcame death and he appeared to so many people to prove to humanity that he was who he said he was. Because let's face it, like the analogy I gave, anybody could technically say these things. People have said things. People have attempted to be prophets. And it never comes true. So God reveals the great things about himself by revealing himself to us, his work. In other words, he gives us evidence. He placed evidence for you to discover before you were even born. I mean, think about it. Let's just go back to basics just for a moment. You had to first be convinced of God's existence in the first place, right? I mean, did he leave you without evidence? Otherwise, there'd be no such thing as a transgression against him. If you didn't know God existed, you'd say, well, then who am I offending? Why do I need to repent? What's the problem? Go to Romans 1.18. Romans 1.18. If you didn't know God existed, if he wasn't ever present in your life as a friendly reminder, then you might not be convicted of transgression. Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. I've taught you that many times. That suppression is the active voice, which means it's done daily. This is an activity that someone has to do. Suppress God. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. How's that for evidence? So don't shy away from the fact that God understands his own children enough to know he needed to reveal himself to them. Remember before you were saved, let's say, and you looked around at nature and said, how can there not be a God? Or maybe you weren't saved yet and you picked up your firstborn or something and said, how can there not be a God? Or maybe you went to the the pound and picked up a puppy and just looked into its eyes and said, how can there not be a God? You're telling me this came out of goo and slop? It just perchance came together and now I got Fido? Does anybody name the dog Fido anymore? (laughs) (laughs) 
What, well, I don't know what you name your dogs. You guys are weird. Probably call them Wayne or Dwayne or something. <laughs> People do that now. It's like human names. You ever hear that? It's like, come on, Paul. What? <laughs> hey, he's their own. How do you not look at any of God's creation, animals, plants, the air, and say, there's no God? That's the point. It's ridiculous. That's why you have to suppress it. And that's what the Bible tells us. Don't ever shy away from the great truth also that his ultimate stamp of approval on his son's work in salvation was Christ's resurrection. You want evidence? Here you go. Here you go. Go to Romans 4.25. Hmm. Romans 4.25. Who, Christ in view, was delivered up for our trespasses, okay, and raised for our justification. Third principle, while the penalty for sin was paid for at the cross, it was Christ's resurrection that vindicated Christ, nullified the sentence of death, and declared him righteous. Again, while the penalty for sin was paid for at the cross, it was Christ's resurrection that vindicated Christ nullified the sentence of death and declared him righteous. So the question is, without Christ's resurrection, where would we be? Without his resurrection, where does that leave us? According to Paul, we just read this, 1 Corinthians 15 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. If Christ wasn't resurrected, then what hope do we all have? When we got baptized... Some of you went down to Colt State Park. Some of you did it in a pool out here. When we got baptized, what were we doing? Should we just have stayed underwater? Because coming out is the depiction of resurrection. When God the Holy Spirit baptized us into union with Christ spiritually, what was He doing? Because we're baptized into his death as well as his life. But if he never was resurrected, he never overcame death, we only get halfway there. Go to John 11.25. John 11.25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. In other words, shall overcome death also in Christ. Do you believe this? Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? My friends, I'll ask the question again. 
What's the greatest news you've ever heard? I won't answer that question for you, as I believe it's personal and between you and the Lord. And I have a very lo- I've long believed, and asked Scott this, that superlatives in teaching the Bible are dangerous positions to take. There are a few, but I try to avoid them at all costs because people get wacky. So I'm not going to give you an answer to that question. Sometimes you can ask a critical question just to get your audience critically thinking about the topic. Because my belief is that a lot of people, a lot of Christians, do not think about resurrection properly. They only think about Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for my sins. And, yeah, keep going. Some people even evangelize that way, and they forget to, they leave the rest out. So just, no, I have long believed that superlatives are dangerous positions to take when teaching Holy Scripture. So I'll just leave you with some Holy Scripture. Go to Isaiah 53.1. Isaiah 53.1. Isaiah 53, 1. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. We are all, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. One last passage from Paul. Go to Romans 6.4. Romans 6.4. Romans 6, 4. <clears throat> I 
We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. One more passage, this time from Peter. Go to 1 Peter 1.3. 1 Peter 1, 3. 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I'll say this. Happy Resurrection Sunday my dear family. I won't tell you what I believe is the, quote, greatest news I've ever heard. But I can for certain tell you the good news about Jesus Christ. And this is right off our website. I suppose maybe if you're going to go evangelize some people and tell them the truth about the gospel of Jesus Christ, you might read this first. Jesus Christ, who is God incarnate, humbled himself to die on our behalf. Thus, he became the sinless sacrifice to pay the penalty of our guilt. He rose from the dead to declare with power that he is Lord over all. And he offers eternal life freely to sinners who will surrender to him in humble, repentant faith. Amen. Scott's going to come up. Let's, uh, we're going to have communion service this morning.
morning. For the next few minutes, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we're going to talk about God's grace towards man's weakness. And that's what the Spirit gave me yesterday. And it goes right in line with what we just heard about the evidence God has given all of us by grace because he didn't have to give any of it but he knows our weakness so I'm going to read a couple passages from the end of Matthew as examples and then we'll get into the Lord's Supper in Matthew 27 50 and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit and behold the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the earth shook, and the rocks split, and tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Hopefully you see God's grace in all of that because God gave supernatural proof to help man get past his weakness. And then in Matthew 28, 1, Now after the Sabbath toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb and behold, there was a great earthquake, and uh, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And think about the end of the Gospel of John where Jesus appeared in their midst in the locked room and said, Peace be with you. And even let doubting Thomas touch his healed scars. All that evidence from God's grace to help man's weakness. He could have just said, Believe me. And that's it. He could have stopped at the miracles he did while he was alive, right? If you don't believe me now, forget you all. But till the end, he loved them through the end, and even in the resurrection, gave supernatural evidence to help man get past his weakness. Thank God for that. So just a few days before this, the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper as the Passover fulfilled at the cross. In Matthew 26, 26, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. In memory of our Lord, let's eat the bread. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's drink the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning's message. We thank you for revealing your grace to us in so many ways. We thank you for all the evidence you've given us to help our weakness, to build our faith. We ask that you help us enjoy this day and rejoice in the resurrection from the dead, that you have defeated death once for all and proved it. Help us rejoice, Father, in our hearts and with those that we are around because you didn't just die for our sins, you rose from the dead for our justification. And we are forever grateful. We ask that you bless us as we go. We ask all these things in Christ's precious name, by the power of your spirit. Amen.